Thank you. What's up, Brad? Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are nuts. You guys are nuts. Thank you. Thank you. I always know when Ghost is in the house. It's good to see you, Ghost. Always good. I just, if there's a thread in this season uh, that I've been able to name, um, it's just gratitude. I'm so thankful for you guys. So, so thankful for being able to be the pastor of this church. It is the greatest gift and highest honor. Uh, gratitude is really all I got for you guys, and you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just, I'm just honored. Thank you. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Whoever you are, wherever you are, however you are today, I want to invite you in these next moments just to rest. Just rest. Just to rest in him. Jesus invites you to rest. And so I trust that these moments, that's what we'll do together. We'll just rest in him. And there we'll find rest for our souls. Just want to say a quick prayer. God, I pray for the deepest nearness of you that we have ever known. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, grab them and turn with me to John chapter 13, verse 23. John 13, verse 23. We're going to begin this message at the table, the table in the upper room. And we're going to end this message back at the table. So John chapter 13 talks a little bit about what's happening in the upper room. John uh, is writing all of this down. He's telling this story through his gospel, and he writes these words, John 13, verse 23. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him at the table. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to Jesus at the table. I want to make sure that you get this scene. It's really important. I think Jesus is celebrating the Passover meal. It's a monumental moment in this great love story, even though the disciples don't totally get what's going on. Um, they don't get all that's happening. John's going to later tell the story, and uh, maybe you can read the whole story this afternoon. That would be really cool if you read the Upper Room story and moves on to the Garden of Gethsemane and then to the crucifixion and resurrection. But as John tells the story, John says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Another word for this disciple whom Jesus loved. Another word for this is beloved, the disciple who was beloved, John the beloved, John the one Jesus loves. This word loves is, or beloved is the same word that God spoke over his son at the baptism, the same word God spoke over Jesus when God said, this is my son whom I love with him, I am well pleased. And the Bible doesn't say this just one time. The Bible actually says this five times, which I think is really cool. I want to just give you two of those examples. Uh, the next example is at the crucifixion when Jesus is on the cross, and the second is at the empty tomb. So if you have your Bibles, flip over to John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, and then John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. So at the crucifixion, I want you to hear this. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2 is the resurrection. Early on, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. 
There's two more references. We won't go through all of those. Jesus appears on the shore. He's cooking breakfast, John and Peter, and then some of the disciples come up, and then that's all in John chapter 21. And Anyway, I'm not sure if you noticed this, but it isn't Jesus who calls John the one he loves. Did you notice that? It's John who's writing this gospel who is referring to himself as the one that Jesus loved. John, who's authoring this gospel, is referring to himself as the one Jesus loved. That's kind of cool. I love it. I think John's doing a couple things here. Uh, it's not about John's personality. It's not about his giftedness. It's not about his, his experiences. John's talking about his identity. He's saying, I'm the one that Jesus loves. I'm the one that Jesus loves. This is pretty radical, I think. John's highlighting the transformative power that Jesus has had over his life. Through God's love, John finds his truth, he finds his purpose, and he finds his identity. He reminds himself, he reminds his readers and all the disciples and all of us that we are loved by Jesus truly, wholly, and unconditionally. That means you are the one Jesus loves. You are the one Jesus loves. To those of you that are here for the very first time, if this is like your first day here, it's kind of a crazy day to be here, but I'm so thankful that you're here today. I want you to hear that you are the one Jesus loves. Jesus guided and directed you to be here today. The whole reason you're here is to be reminded that he loves you. To those of you that have been around here for 12 and a half years, oh my gosh, 12 and a half years, now I want you to hear me say that you are the ones that Jesus loves. You guys that have been here since the beginning, I want you to hear me to say that I love you, and I'm thankful for you. You have given this church two of the greatest gifts that anyone could give. You have given your prayers, and you have given your presence for 12 and a half years. You are the one that Jesus loves. But there are some of you here today that we've been together for like 20 years like the Costins, I think maybe 20 years we've been together. Like before Lily showed up on the scene, we've been together. Some of you guys, we've been around for 20 years. Sonny, Becky, we've been in it together for 20 years. Holy cow. I don't even know what to say except to say, I love you guys. And I'm so thankful that it's you two that we got to go on this crazy journey with. We wouldn't be here without you. These guys wouldn't be here without you, so thank you. You are the ones that Jesus loves. And to the staff of this church, co-laborers in the gospel, folks who have been in the trenches, folks who have been travailing, celebrating blessing, most of the time behind the scenes in unknown, unknown, uh, unseen, unknown ways, want you to hear me say that you are the ones Jesus loves. And for the weight that you have been carrying in this last season, the weight you are carrying, and the weight that you will carry in the days to come, I want to say thank you on behalf of everyone in this room, staff. Thank you. You are the one that Jesus loves, and I love you. And to our elders, it is a very high calling to be an elder. I want you to hear me say, elders, you are the one that Jesus loves. This church needs you, elders. This church needs you guys. And this church is grateful for you guys, especially in this season as a church. And for those of you that pray, some of you guys pray like crazy. Some of you guys text me and say you're praying for us. Those of you that pray, prayer is not the only thing that we do, but prayer is the most important thing that we do. For those of you that pray, I I just want to say you are the one that Jesus loves. He loves your voice. He loves your heart. I'm eternally grateful for your prayers. And to Western Hills Baptist Church, holy cow, our first and most important partner in ministry who gave up their space, just gave it to us, just, hey, partner up with us, partner up with us, to Western Hills Baptist Church, they... You guys, Western Hills, are the ones that Jesus loves. And to those of you that have allowed me into the most personal and intimate spaces of your life, uh, life and death, some of you guys, 
um, and everything in between. Thank you for the greatest gift and highest honor to be with you in suffering and in celebration. Thank you. And lastly, I just want to acknowledge that there are many of you who are hurting. There are some that are confused and feel lost and left and maybe angry and afraid, especially those that have been hurting through this challenging season. Whatever the reason for your hurt, I want you to know that you are the one that Jesus loves. At times, I know some of us, at least for me, I'm tempted to believe that because there's hurt, maybe, maybe I've done something wrong or maybe, maybe God's upset with me. Our circumstances are not a direct reflection of God's love for us. God's love transcends every circumstance. His love prevails in every place of suffering and celebration. If you are hurting this morning, I want to say that I'm sorry for the hurt, whatever the hurt. Each of you here this morning are the one that Jesus loves. And my prayer for the hurting is that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, the God of peace, who fills us with hope in the midst of suffering and grief, will give you rest. Will give you rest. Thinking about John the Beloved, he writes this whole gospel, and he writes these three other letters, And he basically says the same thing in the three other letters, that God is love, and who lives in love, you know, you're the one Jesus loves. And then he writes this crazy, he's led into the revelation, and he gets to see it, and he writes it all down. But again, I'm not sure if you caught this, but John says that he's the beloved. He He doesn't say it once, he says it five times. And he doesn't just say, you're the one that Jesus loves. He says, I'm the one that Jesus loves. Okay, hold on a second. This is going to be participation time. You'll just have to humor me because this is the last time you have to do this. But would you just tell the person sitting next to you, you are the one that Jesus loves. Go for it. Just tell the person sitting next to you, you are the one that Jesus loves. Holy cow, Brett Conway, you are the one that Jesus loves. You are the one. Rev, you are the one that Jesus loves. Everybody smiling, you are the one that Jesus loves. That pretty cool? That feels good, yeah? John the Beloved doesn't say that. He doesn't say, Scott Hellman, the elder, you're the one that Jesus loves. John the Beloved says, I'm the one that Jesus loves. I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you and say, I'm the one that Jesus loves. Go ahead. I'm the one that Jesus loves. I'm the one. (laughs) I'm the one that Jesus. You guys doing it? Not everybody's doing it. What's up with this? I'm the one that Jesus loves. Which is easier? Which is easier to say? I'm the one Jesus, or is it easier to say you're the one Jesus loves? I'm the one Jesus loves. John, John the Beloved says, I'm the one that Jesus loves. I'm the one that Jesus loves. I told you this story a long time ago, but I'll tell it to you really quickly. There's this big b- book, uh, called the legend of the Jews. It's not scripture, but it's sort of this compilation of the oral tradition of the Jewish people. And in it, this author tells the story of King David. It's really amazing. King David in paradise. And in this whole story, David is painted as the superstar of the afterlife. Uh, David is a personage of glory and grandeur whose throne sits opposite God's. It's like really amazing. And there, David sings the Psalms, you know, to God. And he praises him and David has this crown and his crown outshines all others and wherever whenever he moves out of paradise to present himself before God the sun and the stars and the angels uh, the seraphim and all of all of these other holy beings run out to meet him this is not scripture this is just a story but it's a beautiful one and on judgment day God throws a feast and at the feast Uh, We know it in Scripture as the wedding banquet. God throws this wedding banquet. And at the end of the banquet, God invites Abraham to come and bless the cup. God says, Abraham, come. And Abraham says, I can't do it. I am not worthy to bless the cup. And God says, okay. And he invites Isaac 
Isaac, come, and Isaac says, he declines. Isaac declines on the reason of unworthiness. I'm not worthy to bless the cup. So God turns to Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua, all decline for reasons of unworthiness. God, I am not worthy to bless this cup. And finally, God asks David. And David replies, yes, I will pronounce the blessing for I am worthy of the honor. What a heart. What a heart. I love it. We would be shocked, would we not, if the person sitting next to us would say, yes, I am worthy. I'll stand and come forward and bless the cup. We would be shocked. We might think, who does this guy think he is? This story goes on to say that not only was King David in love with God, but God was in love with King David, and David knew it. David knew that he was the one Jesus loved. A bunch of years ago, I was hanging out at Waffle House with some friends, and the manager, I got to know the manager there uh, at Waffle House on Mars Hill. His name was Orlando. And over time, Orlando would always want to come over and talk to whoever I was talking to. And I learned that Orlando used to be a pastor. Uh, so like when he would come over to the table, we would all talk together. And he never felt like he lost his calling. Even though he wasn't serving in a church, he was serving in uh, Waffle House, he never felt like he lost his calling. It was just a super cool, just a super, super cool story. Anytime that I was with someone, he'd come over to the table, and I'd say, I'd say to Rudy, I'd say, hey, Rudy, this is Orlando. He's the one that Jesus loves. And me and Rudy would, Rudy would say, oh, you're the one. You're the one. Oh. And we would just kind of laugh together. And every time that I was in there with somebody and Orlando was there, I'd say the same thing. I'd say, hey, this is Orlando. He's the one that Jesus loves. And Orlando would laugh and one time I said it, and he teared up. And I thought, wow. And he just sort of stood up straight. And he said, yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm the one that Jesus loves. Super cool. Yes, I am. I'm the one that Jesus loves. He started coming to some of our men's studies on Friday morning. He started coming to church with us. He got involved with me. Uh, when I was involved at the King Center in some racial reconciliation stuff that we were doing, he flew with me and my family to Memphis to meet some pastors in Memphis. A bunch of us pastors from here went to Memphis to celebrate uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And we had this big church meeting, and every time Orlando and I would walk up to one of those pastors in Memphis, he would introduce himself. He would say, I, I'm Orlando, the one Jesus loves. And then they would look at me, and I would say, Hi, I'm just Craig. And then he got COVID. And in no time, he was in heaven. And his funeral was like three hours long. It was super long. And by the time that I got up to speak, the only thing that I needed to say was, this is Orlando, the one that Jesus loved. And he knew it. John the Beloved is sent to live in exile on this island because of his great love for Jesus. And there, John has one of the most profound spiritual experiences given to any human. John, the beloved, is given this sort of behind-the-scenes glimpse into heaven. And it was just a brief encounter, but John got to see the mystery of God being revealed, the sort of end times, and then how eternity is all going to play itself out. And he writes it down in the book that we call Revelation. And when this visit concludes, John writes these words, chapter 19. John's doing his best. He articulates this scene. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And the angel said, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. And I think about this a lot. And so many of my friends, and my mom, and my sister-in-law, and my in-laws, so many of my friends, some of you guys have friends there. Uh, some of you guys, we've celebrated 
promotions to glory here together. So many, Sonny, so many we've celebrated with you guys here. I think about heaven a lot. And I think about what this supper, what this banquet might look like. And I think about my buddy Orlando sitting there at the table and it comes time to bless the cup. And David stands as he would and says, you know, I'm honored to bless the cup. And God says, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, David, hold on. And he motions to Orlando. And Orlando stands at the end of the table and he says, yes, I will pronounce the blessing for I am worthy of the honor. I am the one that Jesus loves. Orlando is not worthy to bless the cup because of how good he was or how moral or kind or loving. Orlando is worthy to bless the cup because Jesus made it so. At great cost, all by his own doing, on his own initiative, Jesus made Orlando his own. Loved him without condition and with no expectation. Forgave him without remainder, placed his own name on him, making Orlando a chosen person, a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, one who belongs to God, and now he lives in total freedom, peace, and love. Orlando is the one that Jesus loves, and he knows it. How about you? How about you? How about you? Do you know it? Do you live that way? What would it look like to live knowing that you are the one that Jesus loves. If you have your Bible, flip over to Psalm 23. Uh, Give me 10 more minutes, I'll be done. You can hold me to it, Evan, 10 minutes. Psalm 23. Probably one of the most well-known psalms in all of Scripture. It's most frequently read at funerals. I've read it a bunch at funerals for sure, but it's really not about dying. It's really more about living. It's written as a prayer. This Prayer is what it looks like to live as the life of the beloved, as the one that Jesus loves. It's really a prayer at how to live and love as the beloved. So I'll just read it real quick. We'll talk about it for just a moment. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's start at the top. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, Real quick, how many of you would say that the Lord is your shepherd? Would you raise your hand? The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, John records Jesus saying these words, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus is my good shepherd and I lack nothing. You don't have to say this out loud. Maybe you could just whisper it to yourself. I lack nothing. Go ahead. I lack nothing. But maybe you could tell the person sitting next to you, you could just kind of tap them on the shoulder and go, hey, 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 I lack nothing. Go for it. Go ahead. It's okay. Hey, I lack nothing. Not everybody's doing it. I see you, Hunter. Not everybody's doing it. Okay, how about we do it this way? Just tell the person sitting next to you, you lack nothing. Would that be easier? Totally easier. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You lack nothing. I lack nothing. If Jesus is your good shepherd, you lack nothing. Uh, Your boss, you know, your coach, your sister, your colleague may not believe that you lack nothing. (laughs) In fact, they may tell you otherwise. Your circumstances, your finances. Your finances may tell you that you lack a lot. (laughs) Your doubts, your fears, they may tell you something different. But if Jesus is your good shepherd, you lack nothing. I lack nothing. 
I am the one that Jesus loves. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. I know there are a lot of you here today that are tired. I know that there are a bunch of you that are weary. Some of you are burned out, and some of you are bum, bum, bummed out. You are the one that Jesus loves. And if you'll follow him, if you'll trust him, trusting him, even if it means going to places you'd rather not go, trusting him, even if it means going to a place that has not been made known to you, even if it means leaving everything you know, even if it means trusting him with your entire story, even if it means leaving everything that is safe and secure from all alarms, our good shepherd will give you rest. He will give you soul rest, green pastures, quiet waters, right paths for our good and his glory. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Being the one Jesus loves doesn't mean that you're going to be protected from pain or suffering or death or persecution. It does mean that Jesus is going to be with you in all of those places. And because he is with you, the central promise of the Bible, you do not have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid. Fear is not from God. It's just not from God. Whatever the fear, it's not from him. I have heard those whispers time and time again. I have heard them every night, and I have heard them every morning. Those whispers, those accusations, that stuff that wants to condemn. No, it is not Jesus. It is not God. Jesus teaches us to pray, deliver us from the evil one. That's what the evil one does. The evil one whispers to you. Accusations, condemnation, shame. He whispers fear. Think about it. Think about it. I will fear no evil, for you are with me, for I am the one that Jesus loves. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Because he is our good shepherd, he meets us just as we are, right where we are. He loves us just where we are, right where we are, and he leads us from there. He doesn't leave us there. He leads us from there. His rod protects us. His staff pulling us back from places of harm. God is the God of all comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. There will be enemies. And maybe even enemies at your table. There may be some, a couple of you have told me over the last week or so, there may be some of you who feel like the enemy has won. Maybe some of you sitting here today that think, man, the enemy has won. Can I just say loud and clear, the enemy cannot win because Jesus has already secured the victory. In the presence of your enemies, your cup overflows. He comforts and he blesses. He comforts and he blesses. The victory is already won. For you are the one Jesus loves. And goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Because I am the one that Jesus loves. Let's go back to the table. We'll end the message at the table. John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, and having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus is preparing his disciples for him leaving. He's trying to help them understand the cross and death and burial and resurrection, and he gathers them around this table. And he says this, the Luke records him saying this, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It's beautiful. Jesus knows he's going to suffer, but he says, I just want to be with you. And around the table, he told them about loving God, and he told them about surrender and about obedience. And he showed them what it looks like to love each other, humility and honesty. He washed the feet of each one, including the one who was his enemy. And then he may have said something like this. Friends, 
I'm going to lay my life down for you so you can live. My body is going to be broken so you can be whole. And maybe, I don't know, maybe he said, remember my words, remember my touch. They are an expression of my love. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance. And he said, friends, maybe he said something like this, friends, friends, he held up the cup, friends, there is an pouring out that will happen. A pouring out so that you can be filled full. There will be a shedding of blood that will make you free, free for life abundantly and free for life eternity. This cup is the new covenant of my blood which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he said, John writes, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I have eagerly desired to share this meal with you guys today. In just a moment, for those of you who believed and received, we want to invite you to participate in the act of communion. There'll be folks in the four corners of the room, and there's a station up here. If you'd like to participate as Sonny leads us in worship, when you're ready, just want to invite you to come on your own. When taking communion, we don't just remember the act of the sacrifice. We re-enter into the act. We become partakers and celebrators and declarers of the act. This symbolic becomes our reality again. Here, we declare again the victory over sin and death. And it's not something that we do on our own, although it's very, very personal. This is a very communal act. It's you and me. It's us. It's we. It's ours. At this table, we are not alone. We are united with Christ and with each other. Communion is the great unifier. It is to be taken in an act of remembrance of the sacrifice, but it is also an invitation for living together around the table with all of his people around the world. My prayer is that in these moments, there would be a kindling of a fire that would fan into flame a kind of unity that this church has never known. As you take communion, would you remember and declare And would you pray for unity and oneness, first with you and God, then with you and the person sitting next to you, and then with you and the person sitting across the room from you? We come to this table, and we get to taste just a little of what we will one day experience at his heavenly table. This is a foretaste of glory divine. So let's celebrate. Let's declare, let's remember, let's worship. How about we close this message with you joining me in saying the Lord's Prayer out loud. Can we do it? Let's do it together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.